all the panelists thank you for taking your time off much appreciated but seriously the message which will go for a longer period of time as more people start seeing it and forwarding it that can is you, what i want to give can you please remove that dr uday parekh from my this thing i don't know <laughs> ashok uday uday parekh or let me rename myself you can you can do it yourself right upper corner yes डन डन Uh, doctor, you are live now. All of you. Yeah. Good evening, friends. Welcome again this Thursday on our show, Mirror Wisdom Reflected. Last week we had Brahma Kumari, Didi Shivani speaking to us and giving us a lot of counselling about how we can live our little life. Some of her basic take-home principles. are absolutely stunning and breathtaking to be followed in day to day life not just renunciation of the world but what we can do at this point in time when the covid scenario is getting better in this country but at the same time it's getting worse in europe you can see that the curve is really worse than march what's happening over there in europe at this point france is closing down italy is in a bad shape london may close down soon us because of the elections is not doing something much fortunately in that trough and uprise in the downrise that we have in covid we are at the downside at this point but this i feel is the lull before the storm as diwali comes as navratra goes and as the things start opening up and unlock opens up further we might see a big spurt in cases today i have very dear friends of mine four of them who have gone through covid i want to share their experience as to what they did and what what was the first feeling it's so very important because it always happens that it happens to somebody else but when it happens to you what you should do what you should not do how can we go about living our normal life without really getting scared it's kind of a flu kind of a virus it's just that if you take care if you are diagnosed very early if you seek help at the right time these are things which are very vital for most people but to get us an insight onto what their experience was during the whole period of covid we have have with us a very very established panel we have mr anand pandit who is a very famous producer a builder property developer and a multifaceted human being a wonderful human being who loves to share he loves to to a real philanthropic man i know that he has taken care of all his workers on his construction sites all throughout the covid time he has done a lot for the society he was uh, the treasurer for the bjp in in maharashtra a wonderful human being who wants to share what exactly happened a lot of people don't want to share they are scared that by telling somebody else you know my i'll become an untouchable which is not true these are highly educated very accomplished people who are willing to give their story that don't be afraid face it bravely then we have with us vinita dwivedi she is herself a professor here down here in andheri itself at bawans college and she is a teaching communication skills to a lot of people she is extremely good in what she says very vocal very very interesting story that she has to tell us she will come out with some very important pearls for us we have dr suvira jain who is an ophthalmologist in bombay and she has been working in a charitable hospital not really worried about but really always worried about patients she has set up sops for a charitable hospital with meager amount of money how well those protocols were established how the patients were taken care of despite all the worries all the emergencies all the staff to be protected all the junior residents to be protected this is something very important an opd of more than 150 200 patients when most doctors were not ready to see patients because an ophthalmologist needs to go close to the eye but she carried on the opd and somewhere some slip and she got into covid and we have uday parekh who's a software engineer and a developer construction person a dear friend 
who started who took all the precautions under the sun and i know this for sure i can vouch for it he and his wife took a lot of precautions but there was some slip somewhere and they got covid positive but let's begin with the first story vinita the ball is in your court tell me what was the first feeling when you saw that you were positive from arogya setu and what was your feeling you can imagine it is a dreadful uh, thing that we have all been thinking but also i think in some ways it is uh, not surprising you kind of expect something can happen and it is happening to like you just now in introduction said even when we have taken all precautions we really don't know how this virus actually works and uh, in my case it was a very uh, a very severe backache that it started with a body ache that was not going away with the normal paracetamol and it was something that i had never felt before so in my mind i was quite pretty sure there's something is wrong and this is not normal uh, fever or something like that and i was doing classroom sessions at that time so first i thought maybe it's just a bad posture but this was really really bad and i got a feeling that my whole back was gone uh, i i thought that may be covid and i called up a doctor friend of mine and she said she advised me to start on a prophylactic dose of ivermectin uh which some doctors are advising people for people to take and everybody obviously gives you zinc and vitamin d and and um i just started doing that when my mother who was visiting and she uh she was with me and she's 70 plus and she complained in the evening that next day that she had a fever now that's when i really got worried because we all know that uh, covid is really worrisome for older people and immediately we decided to get ourselves tested so both my mother and i uh, we went to ambani hospital which has a, a drive in and you can just go into the emergency and get a test done actually uh, so we didn't have to take an appointment i just called them up and i went there and they did, we did a test and we had to wait to for the report till the next day and obviously before the report comes the bmc guys come to your home and you know that you're positive and and that's how it started um for me this story has many levels and i don't know how much time you will have what i would say is very quickly is this that uh the very day that the report came back and the bmc got involved the first thing they wanted was to for me to home quarantine i didn't have any other real big problems no fever or anything yet but for my mother they said she had to be put in the hospital at that time they had a rule that people who are above 60 had to be uh, necessarily been put in a hospital and that's something i really tried to ward off because she had no other symptoms and she was feeling quite all right and so she was sent to a hospital after much to and fro and I call you also at that time all hell broke loose because it's not just that you are positive but you also have to find a half hospital bed bed which was in private hospitals hard to come by at that time uh, covid was raging because this was 6th of september which was just after the ganpati festival where suddenly there was a big uptick in the cases and we had to send her to a hospital and she was there for 3 nights you know what the wonderful thing is she was completely all right uh there was no fever no headache no body ache nothing happened to her at all at all and they released her they asked her to go back on the fourth day she came back home she was in a dose of favipiravir and uh, i was not feeling very well so my doctor suggested that i get and dr himanshu mehta as one of the doctors suggested that i should get a the chest ct scan done and i did that and i had a mild pneumonia so i also started on favipiravir uh right and we were all right we were watching tv we were eating food we were quarantining ourselves my mother and i we have thankfully big enough uh, you know place so that we could have our own room and bathrooms and everything was going well until the 12th which is so we test on the 6th until the 12th which is you can say around 10 days later on the 6th the report came back fourth we tested so 10 days later she starts having fever again and she had nothing going by then so we thought that and the doctors thought that it was a secondary infection which she may have picked up like a, a, a you know a bacterial infection so she started another dose of uh, ba- uh, antibacterials fever goes down but in two days time she starts to you know show more symptoms and we can see that her spo2 is falling and so on the 16th we have to take her back to her hospital and this time this is really bad and uh, then she stayed in the hospital for several days she had to be in the icu um and uh, really basically uh, they gave her every possible drug that there is to give uh, from remdesivir to the injection that we had to buy and all of those very expensive and all kind of intrusive treatment that was to be done was done to her 
in the meanwhile, you can imagine two weeks have already passed since I have tested positive. I am at home looking after my son and uh, my husband starts feeling unwell and we test him. And despite him being completely away from us, he still tests positive. And, and his D-dimer test, levels are very high. His, his yes, and because, very yeah, high. Yeah, and he said, yeah. Dr. Sub said that maybe you should get his blood test. Now, by now, we are COVID experts. So we run all the tests. And his D-dimer is through the roof. So there is something going on with his cardiovascular system. So we have to put him in the hospital again, where he gets two shots of Clexam injections uh, every day. And we are at home. And my mother is very unwell. Dr. Mehta uh, actually helped me in that time. And he tried to find out what was her health. And the doctors there said that we couldn't say anything about her. And I mean, this was something that uh, completely unprecedented because Dr. Mehta, I hear of a lot of people who actually have COVID, like you said, like a flu. It comes and it goes and people have some problems, but it doesn't really, like we say, shit hits the fan. In this case, we were uh, completely clueless what's going on. I have a 10-year-old at home. He was all right, but we were still so worried and I was not feeling well myself. Those two or three days, I can say some of one of some of the worst days of my life's life and not physically, I think mentally kind of trauma that I'll, I'll stop you through. for a second here but I must tell the crowd at this point that this is brave lady was single-handedly handling a husband who was in one hospital mother-in-law in mother her mother, mother in my mother, mother ICU yeah, yeah. and she herself suffering from COVID and managing everything from one particular position to see that everything goes smoothly I respect her for that you know single-handedly she had been handling three people including her own self and a little child fortunately he did not develop and go ahead I just wanted to hear that that what so, you must be going through. And, yeah. Uh, so, and, and that, as I said, because we don't know. I mean, I know right now of a friend, somebody who's been in the ICU, in the hospital and in the ICU for one month now. So I was fearing the worst and you could expect it. I was just thinking, what will I do if something if worse happened now? Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen and things improved. We uh, For about a week, things were very, very uncertain. But the doctors helped. Also, a lot of good wishes and prayers. We thought of every possible God and every possible mantra like that we can do at that time. And my mother uh, finally came back home on the third. But she didn't test negative for almost about a month after testing positive. So she repeated her test three times and it still came positive. So that's a very strange part of the disease. No, it's not that strange. I don't it, it, is, it is very well known that the dead virus shreds for even a month longer. There are quite a few VIPs you know of who have been admitted for a longer yeah, period of time yeah. only for this reason yeah. because they are shedding the virus. Yeah. So that is not important to do those tests. But I must give you the great determination with which you oh, really you. became a COVID warrior to face this right from the whole thing. But you came out victorious. That is very important. That's something which we really credit that despite all that, mom is back at home, your husband is back at home, he has started working, you have started working, everything is hunky-dory. And now you have something called the COVID warrior, you have the antibodies. So you can face the world. I have a mother, that's the dialogue of the wall. I have a mother. But I had to call you for what not, for like, for even blood, because she had a GI bleeding, so we had to give her extra blood. Uh, then she developed a severe, um, you know, anemia. She also had a massive UTI infection, which was not going away. She was, uh, she, uh, she had an E. coli infection, which was not going by any antibiotic. So she has also really gone through the worst phase of her life. She really has come back from death's door, I would say. The most important message I want people to have is that despite her age and such a severe bout of illness, despite having everything, a second relapse and she got in a second time, she's come back, she's fine, she's back at home and she's working out and doing her routine stuff. The good take home message is that. I'll come back to you, Vinita, again. But meanwhile, my dear friend, Mr. Anand Pandit, the, rep the man who really took a lot of precautions, I know that for sure. He was very, very cautious. He's always cautious and he took a lot of information. He had helped so many people I know across in Ahmedabad and everywhere with COVID. And Anand Bhai, the, the ball is in your court. Tell us how, what was your experience? How did you realize that you got into this? Yes, Anand Bhai, can you hear me? No. Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Yes, yes. Okay. So rather, rather than the story... Uh, my story, because everybody has got different story. I would like to say that the strongest person on the earth, Mr. Trump, or maybe one of the strongest, Amit Shah, or one of the top celebrity, Mr. Bachchan. If all these three gets COVID, we all can get it. So just don't bother about it. Uh, I don't know what is the situation on vaccine. But 
forget about the vaccine i feel everyone will get this so just be prepared for that that's one point second i had all vitamin c or vitamin d3 these that ayurvedic homeopathic everything and i had like a scoreboard of everything of all family members honestly nothing helps i got it uh so theek hai i mean you can take it you know uh and you can have your immunity and other things i had even uh, flu and pneumonia shots also uh still i got it so don't worry about that this is like uh something has come in your road just accept it and take it positively and like uh, earlier speaker said just fight it out we had six people at same day on 6th september we got all six so all six people we got uh, covid positive and we were all fortunate that uh, uh, our ct value were not that high and we were quarantined and also the age was on our side so we will quarantine in the house only and uh, we had actually real fun time and uh, instead of 14 days we extended that to 28 days mm. because during that time we had very good discussion about uh, what the uh, shows we watch what kind of food every day different food we were allowed because this is one of other uh, dc's where food is not a restriction you know only restriction is you are confined to a room so we had real fun time in the evening we used to have uh, like this what zoom call or video call and uh, maybe 2 3 hours we were on the video call sharing each other's experience of course first day we were really scared and some of us had real uh, weakness but then from second or third day uh, everybody were on the road of recovery and uh, uh, we really enjoyed this time and if we take it philosophically positively i don't think anything can be harmed with this so this is my story nothing else thank you anand bhai that was that was very sweet of you to share whatsell hi watch thank you for taking out your time from the icu from dhirubhai ambani hospital so uh, watch is there from dr watch kodar is right there from the hospital we will be coming back to you soon but we are just discussing the stories of the covid warriors each one of them have had covid so anand bhai said something very important which which i i really respect he said very and he admitted he took homeopathy ayurveda kada everything and i know his dashboard i know that big board which he had and it would be ticked by his people that he, everybody has done that but the message given to that take it doesn't matter but don't think that you will not get it despite that it will help you to come out of it faster maybe but don't think that's your immunity against it's your kavach and kundal not necessarily be prepared if you get it it's not that bad as you can listen to what people are saying but be prepared you will get it so if that be so how to pre- prevent yourself and how to make the most of it so what he said was the take home message when anand bhai said take precautions eat well do whatever you have to do but at the same time you may get it and life has to go on thanks anand bhai that was very sweet of you to share your experience and very important insight be watchful if all these big guys trump can get it and boris johnson can get it and if anybody and everybody can get it you can get it too so just just wait for your turn but be prepared in a very nice way don't have your comorbidities with you dr suvira the now, now the talk comes with you you are in a working in a charitable hospital you are working as a doctor and you are faced with patient this is the biggest dilemma lot of lot of senior doctors are still not practicing and being an ophthalmologist you have to go very close to the patient uh, what was your experience what was the first thing when you realized when you got covid what what when did you really ex- expect this or did you accept it um i think the first thing that happened is that i didn't feel well and when you don't feel well it was just simply not feeling well and then comes the denial that no it can't be me it cannot be me and i've actually sat and looked back at how i felt about what i felt and i think the biggest fear that you deal with when you start not feeling well is that oh my god if this is covid am i going to come out of it because even though the mortality rate may be 3% or 2% we hear so many people around us who have actually succumbed to it that that fear of not being able to make it through that illness is the biggest factor that prevents us from getting tested so when i felt unwell i thought 
okay, this is possibly nothing because all I had was a very severe body ache. And I said, but I need to be a good citizen. And I stayed aloof. I stayed isolated in a room. And I said, Dek mein, ek din mein jata hai nahi. because I think it's important that even if we are fearful and we are going to test after two or three days, we at least isolate ourselves. So we do not then harm those we love, those who work for us or those who we work for. And that becomes our own moral responsibility because at the end of the day, you are only and only answerable to your own conscience. So I stayed away. My neighbor wanted to come up to use the loo. Her loo was getting down. I said, no. Uh, and it's scary. It's scary. And then finally, after two days of not getting okay, I said, okay, I'm going to have to get it tested. So very bravely, I got it tested thinking that, okay, I'm going to deal with it. I told the children, I'm a single mother. My children are in America. I live alone and they get so worried that, oh my God, mother, are you going to be okay? So it's very important to have that state of mind that Joby here, I'm going to deal with it. And you got to isolate yourself till you muster the courage of getting tested. Preferably get tested earlier rather than later because you can start the necessary treatment for whatever it is worth. So that's what I did. I delayed by two days, though I stayed apart. I I chose a doctor. I went to Dr. Tushar Shah, who was very kind and gentle and always available. And uh, I also spoke to a very senior homeopath, Dr. Chetna, and she guided me as well. And I decided to just follow because then you get a lot of opinions. You don't know what to listen to. So I think it's important that once you get, and when you turn positive, okay, that's what completely throws you. When the Arogya Setu act from the so-called green for all these months turns red, it's, it's a very frightening thing. Then you, and the fear is, am I going to get out of it? And I, and I feel then you just follow your doctor blindly, rest it out, eat well. And, and I think in the end, I even asked myself that what is it that actually sees us through? Uh, most have not had COVID, many have. I think we all need to work at establishing a good state of physical well-being. We need to work towards it because it's COVID today. It's more COVID tomorrow and maybe something else later. But what really helps is a very uh, a strong a mental attitude and a spiritual approach where I've always believed in over the last three years that you don't focus on what's wrong rather than focus on wellness. If you focus on, okay, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to pull out of it. Jo bhi hai, dekha jayega. Not from a place of arrogance, but from a place of humility and understanding how the universe actually works. I mean, however silly this may sound, this is what has actually helped me. And I think it's very important as being a patient that for the ones who love you, and especially if they're not near you, and they're not going to be near you, whether they're abroad or in the next house, you have to have a very strong uh, mental uh, willpower to yourself through this and then i think eventually it's just all him on to a mind game i think we have to have the wherewithal and the will to say i'm going to deal with this and i think that's what really helps me so you you are a great corona warrior your mother is still in the hospital i realize yes. told me that and she's yes. still recuperating i she wish is, yes. good health and Thank you, you. Really, <clears throat> you really have managed it very well single-handedly uh, children out there worried for you and uh, despite the ups and downs you know congratulations for having gone, gone through and I think you come out with flying colors I guess you should be starting with the hospital work very soon it's, too. I start tomorrow and, in, Great. and I think as physicians we don't have a choice but to be out there working I mean I'm so sure, sure we'll talk about it now we got to do what we got to do you don't know how and when you get it and when you get it you just have to have the way with all to deal with it Udai Parekh, would you like to share some opinion of yours? Your, your, you very, just out of place. Very, very fast because the all the panelists before me have said everything which I actually wanted to say. So there is nothing more for me to say really. Uh, very, very, uh, uh, the fact is the first two days when you get the, no, uh, the, the news that you're positive, Few people in your family are positive, few are negative. So there are the first two days are so, I would say so scary, so, you know, depressing, so uh, uh, full of questions because of uncertainty. You don't know whom, you know, you'll talk to 10 people, so you get 10 opinions. You take medicine, you don't take medicine, you take this medicine, you take that medicine, you eat this, you don't eat this. As, as uh, Suviraji rightly said, get one doctor, follow it. And be very, very mentally strong. As you also said in the beginning, I have taken all possible precautions for the last six, seven months. I still got it. 
my wife, my daughter got it. One of my daughter didn't get it. That was more worrisome for us to keep her away, uh, uh, being in the same house. But uh, uh, you know, uh, thank God that we were all we didn't have symptoms after we tested positive, and every day was just like a normal day with uh, medicine. And today probably is the last day. So now our question starts: What do we do going forward? That's because, why. Watchel, that's why we have got Watchel on the screen. Yes. Right? So I am. I am. I am now. I am now more <laughs> waiting for a doctor to say that now. How do we take this forward? There's one more thing that I wanted to mention, Vinita. The second round, you have the after effect. You know, we were discussing. You had a little persistent cough. Now, would you like to expand a little more on that so that Watchel can give an answer on that? Yes. Uh, I think uh, we've come to the right uh, place where we can ask Dr. Kothari a few things to suggest what to do. Not to cough, sir. I have a different problem. I never got a cough, not at all, throughout this whole COVID thing. I had a mild pneumonia, but uh, I've always had a pain in my chest uh, throughout the COVID period, but it has not gone away. I feel healthy otherwise. I have no other issues. But I've had an ele elevated heart rate. Uh, my SpO2 is normal, but my heartbeat has been uh, higher than normal. And that was very high for a few days after I, I mean, after the 14 days, like Mr. Kwarik is talking about. But recently I got another bout about last week where I could again feel that my um, normal resting heartbeat at night time when I was sleeping was about 90, 95, which is very unusual because I have a low resting heartbeat. It's very annoying. I couldn't sleep very well. And uh, I next day I was feeling extremely tired, like you, you've been running, you know, all through the night. So there is something else going on. And if I go to the internet, it tells me that it is what it's called long COVID these days. And there is not really a lot of information except the fact that there is something called long COVID. And probably it affects people like me who didn't have a very severe COVID. I had a mild COVID when it first came to me. But now I have a longer lasting impact. On it. So don't go on the internet, the first thing that I would tell you. Even most of the doctors don't know. So you might be getting more misguided. Yeah, yeah. That's something so I just thought the term comes from there. That's yes, yes, I understand. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Suvira, you had something to say. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. I, I just think that uh, post-COVID, I mean, I'm not an authority on it. And I think that my doctor told me, and I kind of believe him, that it's, it's, it's a large part of this is a mind game. I think somewhere in our head, if we want to find and get research about Iskibar Kyaos, there is a big article on Google about what are the five symptoms if you have, you're likely to have post-COVID. I think we need to just steer clear of it just live positively and just get on with our lives without being rash and without being uh, aggressive. Gradually jump in, but without thinking, Ab kya hoga? Is my kidney is going to fail in my heart. I just think it's a mind game in a very, very large part of the whole. Yes, thanks, thing. Uh, thanks, Dr. Suvira. But now let's come to the most important guest that we have on our program. My dear friend, Dr. Watsal Kothari. Let me first give an introduction. He is an absolutely genuinely good physician that you cannot get very easily. Highly qualified, one of the best guys from KM. Let me put some more additional feature. His father was Dr. Manu Kodhari, one of our greatest professors from KM Hospital. We are absolutely indebted to him. One of the men who changed my life. I can tell that to Watts right now. And uh, that's something very important. So Watts is very close to me. I've seen him coming from uh, undergrad days to now. And uh, he's one of the finest persons who understands this disease well. He manages more than five, six ICUs at the Kokilabin Dhirubhai Hospital. He's the director of uh, critical care at that. And no better person to give us an insight what's happening in the world. Where are we? Where are we headed? What are the post-COVID complications? Dr. Watsal Kodari, welcome to the show. And thank you for sparing your valuable time. You're in the middle of your rounds. I know that. And still, I've managed to pull you out. I really appreciate you keeping your time. Welcome to the show, Watts. Thanks. Thanks, Imanshu. So, um, do you want me to speak about uh, the current scenario or anything specific okay. that you? Okay. What is the first symptom that a patient should look for? What What should be a, What should they be worry about? Well, you know, many of the manifestations of COVID are very non-specific as a viral illness, and we know that around eighty to eighty-five percent of individuals have a mild illness. But I think the first thing that would actually ring an alarm bell would be a sensation of breathlessness, because that's the time that the virus would be migrating from the upper respiratory tract into the lower respiratory tract and would be causing an inflammatory fluid to build up in the air sacs of the lung, you know, called as the alveoli. And that's the time that, you know, the, the alveoli 
start to have a de defect in the gas exchange you know so the oxygen would not be passing into the blood appropriately and the carbon dioxide of course that comes in a little later but then there are certain receptors in the lung that pick up this situation and signal to the individual that look something is wrong and that's where the sensation of dyspnea or a subjective sensation of breathlessness comes in so that would be the first warning sign of course if there are high hectic fevers very severe body ache or if the individual is unfortunate enough to develop a myocarditis like i think uh, one of our panelists was mentioning that she had a persistent tachycardia so we understand that if this virus you know has a very ubiquitous uh, receptor which is uh, throughout the body the ace 2 receptor and you know it attaches to that through its spike protein so this ace 2 receptor is also there on the myocardium so you know you can individuals can develop a myocardial or a heart inflammation called as myocarditis and in certain individuals they can develop an activation of the clotting system now this clotting system can not only cause clots to develop in the very small blood vessels called as the capillaries which are adjacent to the air sacs you know and which are responsible for carrying the oxygen towards the body and giving up the carbon dioxide you know to the atmosphere but this clotting can also occur in the coronary arteries so you know you have we've had young individuals coming in with heart attacks can occur in the cerebral circulation so the blood vessels which you know are uh, supplying blood to the brain and they can develop clots and you can have a stroke so when young people coming in with strokes and the intervention neuroradiologist tells me that look uh, watsal i'm trying to suck the clot out it keeps on forming very rapidly and also a discussion with one of my colleagues who's in london uh, you know and he was telling me that uh, watsal i was uh, you know dialyzing these very sick covid patients and the moment the blood would come out into the extracorporeal circuit for dialysis it would just clot up in spite of giving them the appropriate doses of the anticoagulation and that's why if you see that in the protocols for our patients who are sick with covid the anticoagulation plays a very big role because there is a tendency for blood to clot excessively so you know in the lungs in the heart in the brain in the kidneys in the legs uh, you know in the veins and they can get a pulmonary thromboembolism you know large clots traveling leg veins into the heart and then into the lungs and causing a, a very a critical state for the patient so in these scenarios what we've understood is that this disease can have protein manifestations we have the 85% who are you know going to have mild illnesses they get away with it and often unfortunately you have people going around saying look hey nothing has happened to me i'm fine with it and that is true most people will be fine but if you take uh, 15% you're going to have severe illness out of that 5% you're going to go into the icu and about 2% who are going to die now that 2% can be anybody of course it would be more uh, you know applicable to extremes of age and especially in the elderly and those who have comorbid illnesses they got heart disease they got lung disease they got kidney chronic kidney disease chronic liver disease they are uh, you know on cancer chemotherapy these are individuals who are more prone but now there are studies which are coming out which are showing that possible there can be a significant uh, individual specific immune response which is some are showing mapping to chromosome 9 now there has to do with the abo blood group there are some studies that are showing that individuals who got blood group a are more prone to a severe illness and then there are other studies which are um, uh, showing that uh, a certain proteins which are involved in the immune response you know where the immune cell recognizes the virus presents it to other immune cells and then triggers off a a a cascade of chemicals which are called as cytokines and these chemicals then up the entire immune system and get it ready to bring down the invader now if this is done appropriately within the first 7 uh, to 8 days the infection comes under control the individual comes out without any major complications but supposing the infection is not brought under control then the immune system keeps on getting up regulated up regulated and then the chemicals themselves cause damage that's why you had the study coming out of oxford showing that steroids work and in fact we had started using steroids quite early on in our hospital because we had intuitively understood that in the pre remdesivir days there was also a significant immune component to this disease which was causing an inflammation in the lungs so besides the steroids there came in then the tocilizumab which is a 
inhibitor of a particular in, uh, cytokine called as interleukin-6. So this interleukin-6 also ramps up the immune system. So in individuals who cannot bring the virus under control within the first week and the immune system starts getting dysregulated, then this interleukin-6 inhibitor has also shown uh, promising uh, results in those where the immune system has gone out of whack cause the severe injury to the lung may also cause a, something called as a cytokine storm, you know, where the immune uh, cascade is causing damage to the organs, which is, you know, uh, separate from the damage caused by the virus itself. And interestingly, this virus can infect this ACE2 receptors, not only in the lung, not only in the blood vessels, not only in the heart, not only in the kidney, not only in the liver, but in the brain. We had individuals coming in with encephalitis, you know, severe inflammation in the brain, and then they've had seizures, and they've had a, a, a you know, and something like COVID encephalopathy. Now, one of our colleagues was mentioning here, one of our panelists, about the long COVID. And the long COVID is another interesting uh, concept which is coming up now because we are seeing something. You know, there was the description of the multi. A system inflammatory syndrome in children, where children who had been exposed to COVID did not have a severe COVID, but had developed COVID antibodies. Later on, these COVID antibodies started to attack the body itself, and they would come in with multi-system manifestations, with heart inflammation, with gut inflammation, with rash, sometimes with cerebral involvement. And now we're beginning to see that even in adults. So we've had quite a few patients coming into our hospital who have got this MIS, now we call it A. Because C was for children, but the multi-inflammatory syndrome for adults. And here you have individuals who may have not have had a severe COVID illness, but who developed a very strong antibody response. So what happens? That when the virus, one of the putative theories is that when the virus infects the cells, okay, and the immune system attacks the cells which are infected by the virus, the cells break down, they release their own proteins. So the individual then develops antibodies against his own proteins. And these can then trigger off an immune reaction once the individual is actually recovered from the COVID itself. So, you know, the individuals can come in with severe heart inflammation, can come in with a, a syndrome looking like septic shock with high-grade fevers and hypotension and liver dysfunction and a rash and renal dysfunction. And we are desperately looking for an infection which is not actually there, but it's just a dysregulated immune response which has suddenly woken up because it has been kicked into action by a previous COVID infection. So, you know, this is a virus which is having very, very unusual manifestations. Not only was, you know, when I discussed about the severe clotting manifestations that occur, but uh, the fact that now you can have a situation where individual has recovered from COVID, but a few weeks down the track can develop inflammation, which can then present in many, many uh, perplexing and mysterious ways. And this has been now they're mapping out that there could be some relationship with the chromosome three, where there are these particular proteins which are involved in the cell-cell interaction, you know, the interaction of the immune system with the initial cells, which uh, catch the virus, you know, ingest it, and then presents its protein to the immune system that, hey, look, there is an invader, and let's now start building up our antibodies and our other uh, cellular responses to try and overcome that. But this can then actually overshoot and can create problems. So what's the, we do not, I mean, ex fantastic explanation. This is not to scare people. You know, his explanation was for doctors. It could be very scary if a person hears as a layman. It's not. But the point he's trying to mention is that in the past six months, by flattening the curve, we have understood our enemy a lot better. In the beginning, we had no idea. You've seen those Italian doctors had no idea what, was, what they were facing. New York had no idea what they were facing. But over a period of time, we have learned to identify the enemy, what all things it can do. So steroids and the anticoagulants have become a mainstay of treatment. But I think the antivirals, Himanshu, because that has played a big role also. Though, I mean, worked. there are studies which... Question. The latest study on Ramdesvir is telling us that it is not having any significance. Would you believe that? Because it still works very well. I look, whatever, uh, you know, experience we've had in our hospital, I think Remdesivir works. It is not going to work if you're going to use it late. Okay, ah. because by that time, the immune system has gone out of whack. And that's what is going to create trouble. But if we use it early on, what is what, to... now, I, I want to ask you this major, major question. Generally, people spend two to three days on an average before they get themselves tested. First is, no, it cannot happen to me. Two, no, no, it's a regular flu. TK, TK. Everybody got a flu in the last six months. But nobody wants right. to test. Something then strikes and somebody forces and they do a test. And then they come positive. Now, worse is even if they come false negative. And this is one third of the population which is false negative. Now, this is where the catch-22 starts for them. 
you know, they are symptomatic, they have problems. I have a person who has HRCT grossly positive for that and negative. So tell me this, what is in time, what is early, what is late? This is something very important for the layman because everybody says you come late. Now, what is this late and what is in time? When do you need hospitalization? <clears throat> when you feel you need hospitalization. So that's one. Okay. If you're getting, if you're getting breathless, if your oxygen is falling and look, you don't have to wait for you're sitting at rest and you're checking with a pulse oximeter that look, my oxygen saturation is dropping below 94%. But even doing a six minute walk test, just walk around the room at a reasonably brisk uh, pace, whatever pace is comfortable for you, which you can max. Okay. And check if your oxygen saturation is falling. When it was a rest, it's 96, 97. But you walked around, it's become 92%. There's a, there's a problem. You know, if you have a stress test in cardiology to pick up a, a occult uh, ischemic heart disease, the same way this kind of uh, six-minute walk test can pick up whether there is a, a subclinical involvement of the lung, an early involvement of the lung, which is not initially generating a sensation of dyspnea or breathlessness at rest. Secondly, identifying those individuals who are going to be at risk. Okay, so, you know, the, uh, the elderly, those who've got chronic renal failure, those who've got cardiovascular disease, those who've got chronic lung disease, those who've got cirrhosis, you know, so, and those who are on cancer chemotherapy. So in these individuals, one has to have a vigilance, you know, checking the temperature twice a day, doing the six minute walk twice a day, looking at some of the inflammatory parameters in the blood, looking at the CRP, you know, you can look at the interleukin-6 in the blood. You can look at the D-dimer because the D-dimer is a marker of clotting. So the D-dimer is rising. If the ferritin is rising, if the troponin is, you know, that there is a subclinical uh, myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, the troponin is going up. Or if the CPK, because the virus can go into the muscles. So there's severe myalgias, check your CPK. If that is also going up, it's telling you this virus is spreading. And if it's spreading, you may be one of those individuals where your immune system may just dysregulate, even though the, you are not having the other so-called risk factors for having serious disease. So, you know, as you mentioned, Imanchu, I'm not here to try and scare the public. Okay. I am with the public. Hey, look, 85% don't have a problem. But the 15%, you don't know if you're going to land up in that 15%. Because not all those people who are in the 15% are the elderly and those with comorbid illnesses. You can have individuals who are relatively young, who are relatively fit, but whose immune system just somehow doesn't, uh, you know, uh, fit in with the virus very well and goes out of, uh, you know, gets dysregulated and itself creates trouble. And then you have these individuals who have had mild disease who are coming in now with the so-called long COVID or the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in adults, which is also occurring in children. So we, therefore, we are, are I, you know, knowledge about this virus is evolving by the day. We don't know everything about it. And it makes sense to remain prudent, to remain cautious, and understand that, hey, look, I think we did a great thing in going in for these lockdowns. I know there are people who are saying that, well, you know, we should have done it, not done it. But I think the lockdown gave time for the systems to get into place, to deal with the outbreaks as they occurred in a timely manner. Had everything burst open like, had it, ha like it happened in Italy and some of the other European countries or in, even in the U.S., we would have been totally overwhelmed. Here now, what we are seeing, that there are systems in place to deal with the problem. There are these antivirals. And coming back to antivirals, we feel that the antivirals work, the remdesivir works. So the, when you say early, early is thinking about it. Should I take the antiviral? Or the doctor's thinking, should I give the antiviral? Because it makes sense. By and large, we've not seen serious side effects. Yes, you can have car, uh, renal failure and uh, liver failure and hyperuricemia and hyper... All these things. But... By and large, we have not seen serious side effects with either remdesivir in the seriously ill patients or favipiravir in those who are less seriously ill. And giving it in the first week of illness, that's when the viral replication is occurring, makes sense. If you start giving it late, 10 days, 12 days, when already the virus has you know, tickled the immune system, the immune system has gone out of whack, it's like somebody coming in with severe sepsis, say, because of a urinary tract infection or a bacterial pneumonia, where the antibiotics are given very late, the antibiotics kill off the organism, but the organism has tickled the immune system so much, stimulated so much, that itself causes the damage and causes the demise, ultimate demise of the individual. No, brilliant. That, that is true, Watsal. That, that's a very great answer that you gave. Now, 
the most important question a lot of people 85% who don't need home quarantine or they are in mm. these quarantine centers should be should they be taking fabiflu or should they be, be taking ivermectin this is the present scenario this is where the dilemma is whether to take to take anything because a lot of people have not taken also have been fine what is yeah, your i don't I, i i personally don't think ivermectin works in the body it may work in some laboratory whether i think the study was done in bangladesh or some other country but i'm not too sure it really works in the body i do not advocate ivermectin okay secondly i would uh, definitely uh, say that look if there is any uh, chance that one has been exposed it behooves uh, precaution to have at least some kind of self quarantining especially from individuals in your own household who could be vulnerable to severe disease okay then secondly doing a testing because you know the incubation period median incubation period is about 5 to 6 days you know and i've had many individuals gone out for uh, parties and socializing and lonavla etc and then they find one of them has you know turned out to be positive and everybody gets into a panic so yes i am not here to uh, you know scare people but i also want to give a certain element of uh, word of caution that look you may not have a serious problem but your mother can your father can or you could transmit to another individual who is you know having some other comorbid illnesses who can have uh, serious problems and let us understand one thing that until about 50 to 60% of the population has got an immunity against this virus it's not going to come under control so i'm sure that there are going to be waves at this particular point of time with this given activity level there is again now a uh, you know a reduction in the number of cases because yeah a certain element of herd immunity is building up but how much is it is it 15% 20% 30% in the time when we're going to reach 50% 60% at the time that the virus is really going to come under control and at that time we still need to behave in a responsible manner maintain appropriate social uh, distancing maintain the essential activities which are required have a mask maintain a hand hygiene not only for ourselves but even for those who may be more vulnerable than us and who can have a serious problem with this illness what you're saying is a very simple thing the virus can only enter your body from your nose or your mouth it can't get in from the ears it can't get in from the hair it can't get in from the skin it can't get from anywhere else eyes uh, it can get uh, in from the eyes okay. <laughs> you're an ophthalmologist i, I will so agree, I should, disagree with you but <laughs> but you know the virus the virus can 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 survive on inanimate surfaces yeah, right. and the actual num- the days is not known but maybe two days three days or whatever so supposing you know somebody with a, with the viral infection has sneezed has touched his nose then has touched the door handle somebody else goes and touches the door handle then inadvertently rubs his eyes can inoculate because this virus can enter through mucous membranes okay, okay. so okay. whenever it has got a contact with mucous membranes it can enter into the system so that is the situation where we have to understand that it is not only nose it's not only mouth it's also the eyes and we have to keep our hands clean okay because even for those who are self quarantining not only do they try and stay within a room with an attached toilet but if they going out into the common areas they have to be wearing a mask the individuals who are meeting with them also should be wearing mask and they're touching any common surfaces those surfaces have to be regularly clean so that they do not act as fomites to transmit the virus onto somebody else's hands who can then inoculate himself or herself primary treatment for 85% of patients who are not hospitalized would you give fabiflu for them no i would not because i would look at it that look are there any uh, danger signs here in the sense first of all is there a background where the individual could become sick a so which means like i said that you know age age more than 65 years or if there is chronic renal failure chronic lung disease chronic heart disease uh if the patient is on cancer chemotherapy if the individual is obese and for some individuals uh, i mean uh it's 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 interesting but males have a greater propensity for trouble as compared to females okay the females are relatively protected but one is the high risk groups two is very significant symptoms in the individual so if there are very high fevers if there are a lot of body ache malaise and you know total lack of appetite this virus can also infect receptors in the gastrointestinal tract so you can, you can individuals who get diarrhea or vomiting Now, these are individuals who can become rapidly dehydrated that can concentrate the blood that can further predispose to clotting and thrombosis so these again would be a relatively high risk group and then we can look at certain blood parameters so if the lymphocytes are falling 
if the CRP, which is a marker inflammation, is rising, okay, if the interleukin-6 is rising, if the D-dimer is rising, if the ferritin is rising, the CPK is rising, these again are markers to tell you, look, these individuals initially, though they may be not having physical symptoms which are significant, but the laboratory markers are going towards a progressive inflammatory state, then these are the individuals who are going to be benefiting with the antiviral agents, okay? And then, of course, if they develop any kind of lung involvement and hypoxemia, then the steroids come in, right? So in these situations, one has to look at it on a case-to-case -case basis. I mean, it's a young individual, he's an 18-year-old guy, he's got a mild fever, he's got a little bit of cold, he may have a little bit of loss of taste, loss of uh, smell, and mild body ache. He's not a candidate uh, to be given uh, you know, antivirals. You look at his blood test, they're not showing that the CRP is raised or the you know, D-dimer is raised. Well, hey, look, just take your, uh, you know, have a little bit of self-quarantining, have an appropriate uh, healthy diet, take your vitamin D, vitamin C, a little bit of a zinc uh, containing multivitamin, and you're going to be fine. How much but of vitamin D? Should you be more than 80 for this? You know, vitamin D, general levels for Indians are around between 20 to 40 now. So would you double that for the time being? <laughs> Yeah, 40, 50 is good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the same panel, Vinita said something about tachycardia. Would you like to tell her something? Does she need a cardiac opinion? Does she need a stress test? What, what would she need? You heard a little story. Of course, I did. So, is the tachycardia still present? I have stopped looking at my Fitbit. I just wanted to not think about it too much. And it helped a little bit because I was starting to meditate. But there is still pain. I have a back pain and there is a little bit of pain on the left side of my chest. That's not going away. Yeah. So it might make sense that, uh, you know, if, uh, if overall your, your symptoms are getting better, just forget about it. But if the tachycardia is keeping you awake at night or the pain is still bothering you, a simple thing would be to do a 2D echo. Okay. There's ultrasonography of the heart. First of all, see that your heart function is well. Also, at the same time, you know, there are simple cardiac markers called as troponin I and a BNP to just tell you that they are in the normal range. Okay. If your echo is good, your cardiac markers are good, just give it some time. Even if there is a mild inflammation of your heart because of the COVID is going to go away. Yeah. But in case your symptoms are increasing, then of course, you need further evaluation. Vinita, well, you wanted to I'm ask a question. You are raising your yes. finger. You wanted to ask a question to Dr. Watsal? Yes, I, I, I am asking, I think on behalf of all four of us who are COVID survivors here, is what is the chance of reinfection here, sir? And how much precaution should we take? What should we do? And should we really worry? And it is related to the thing about antibodies, uh, because then vaccine works via antibodies only. Then shouldn't we think that we are already, we don't, do we need a, a vaccination then? So expand on vaccine, what's it? that's my next question, which was going to be there. How okay. soon are we getting it and what is the role of vaccine? How much would you trust it? And with so many strains coming up, is it going to cover up all the strains? So I'll take Vinita's question yes. first and then yours, Imam. Yes. yes, yes. So what about reinfection? Yes. Oh, well, it's possible. I mean, there are now documented cases of reinfection. Why should reinfection occur? It can occur, A, because there was never an appropriate immune uh, uh, response mounted in the first place. Supposing it was a very mild infection. And there were not enough of neutralizing uh, antibody titers generated with the first infection. Then it's possible to get a second infection. Okay. The second uh, point is that, look, these antibody levels can wane with time. So, you know, over the three months, the antibody levels can fall. And therefore, the protection that is, you know, uh, afforded against a reinfection would drop. Thirdly would be that if there is a mutation in the virus... Okay, where now the virus is generating new proteins, which the antibodies which were formed against the initial strain do not recognize, then also reinfection can occur. Okay, so reinfection is a possibility. And therefore, one has to remain to be prudent in spite of having had an infection. And in spite of, because it's worthwhile then, of course, looking at your antibody titers. But if you are having significant antibody titers 10 times, 15 times what the cutoff is, then yes, you are having a certain element of protection. But is this protection going to be forever? Well, we don't know because it's very likely that these uh, levels would fall over time, one. And two is if the virus mutates, is this going to work? Then it may not work. All right. So that's one. Now, coming back to Imanchu and uh, talking about vaccines. So yeah, this is an unprecedented situation where vaccines are really being 
hurried along because there's a lot of pressure to generate a vaccine. And how do these vaccines act? I mean, of course, they either they you know take bits of the vi virus and then you know uh, inject them into individuals to generate an immune response. The immune response would have two arms, a, a antibody arm and a cellular arm. And you would want a vaccine that generates a, a, a stimulation of both arms, not only antibodies, but the T cells, which are very important also in killing off uh, cells which are infected with the virus also need to be stimulated. Now, there are different types of vaccines, those which are utilizing the genetic material of the virus, which are RNA based, those which are using a uh, a, a common cold uh, virus, uh, you know, like an adenovirus, which is then uh, you know, impregnated with the proteins of the SARS-CoV-2, which then, you know, generates, a, is, in fact, is, is inoculated into the individual by an intramuscular injection. And then the immune response generates antibodies against the SARS uh, uh, proteins. But, uh, you know, here one has to keep in mind a couple of things. Whenever a process is hurried up, you know, we should know, we should make sure that there are no corners being cut and looking at the safety of vaccines. Because remember that these are also stimulating the immune system. You don't want a situation where there is some offshoot stimulation of the immune system, which can actually harm the individual who's been given the vaccine. That's number one. Number two is that, is it generating an antibody response against the appropriate proteins, which will prevent the virus from entering into the cells of the individual and replicating in the individual. Okay. And thirdly, I mean, uh, do we require one dose? Do we require two dose, etc.? That's also, th th these are all questions which are still up for, uh, you know, being answered. And there are many candidate vaccines, but if you see the number, the initial, the number of companies were very many in the, in the phase one of the trials, then the phase two, they came down even further. The phase three, there are just maybe 11, 12 vaccines, which are actually going around, uh, uh, you know, which are showing some kind of efficacy. But uh, what is the time frame here? It's difficult to say because, you know, there are companies who are saying that, look, by the end of December, we're going to be having a vaccine. Then once the vaccine comes out, who's going to be getting the vaccine? How are we going to decide that, look, these are the individuals who should first be getting the vaccine, then these individuals, then because they're, you're looking at trying to immunize the whole world. And even if you're looking at a country like India, which has got 1.3 billion people, you know, there are in, uh, individuals who are saying that we triage the vaccine. First, we'll give it to the healthcare workers or the frontline individuals who are dealing with the infection so that they are protected, whether it's the doctors or the paramedical staff, or we're looking at some of the, the you know, the, the, the police and et cetera. Those, those uh, group of individuals, then the individuals who are more likely to develop complications. That would be probably the second, uh, you know, set of individuals who would be where you would be giving the vaccine to, and then finally going into the general populace. But let's understand one thing that there are, it's important to have a fair idea that the vaccine is safe because, you know, you don't want to create a problem by trying to solve a problem. And the second is, of course, the immunogenicity of the vaccine, that how good an immune response is going to generate in order to protect the individual. So at this point, you know, nothing which is really round the corner, but yes, companies are saying that we'll have it by the end of the year and then we're going to start mass production. And, you know, by the middle of next year, we'll have a large pop uh, amount of the population which has uh, been uh, vaccinated. So let's hope that happens because that sounds, that will be something that will give us a certain element of uh, relief and cheer. So as you mentioned, Dr. Watson, that out of 130 crore population of this country, if you need to have herd immunity, we need more than 60 to 70 crore population, 70%, which means almost 80 crore plus people who should have got infected, which might mean a mortality of more than a crore people. We, this country cannot afford that. Yeah. yeah, we are, we, I know if, It's very easily spoken and a very misleading term has been herd immunity. And how, you know, how England changed its own terminology. Sweden paid a price for it. And uh, so go ahead. You're saying something. What? No. So like if you look at the, the, the flu vaccine, every year people have to take shots because the flu virus keeps on mutating. So what about the COVID-19 uh, virus? If it keeps on mutating, every year you'll require a new set of vaccines to utilize. And, you know, vaccines also mature a long time. So the first uh, set of vaccines may not be as effective as vaccines coming down two or three years later. Okay, personal question on a personal note. Do you think this is a doctored virus? <laughs> <laughs> 
or your personal opinion. You'll not be quoted anywhere. But something very important that the crowd wants to know about. Well, is there is the normal virus behave like this. It doesn't. So there is. It doesn't. You know. So there is a lot of evidence uh, coming out from various corners of the globe, yes. which is pointing towards. Okay, look, this could be a chimera. This could be a fusion of two viruses. That's why it's having such odd, such protean manifestations, and it's so slippery. I mean, if you are 15 minutes in contact with somebody face to face, you are very likely to have then inhale the virus into you. And we talk about the six uh, feet distance, but you know, if if you look at the studies of coughing and sneezing, yeah, there are large droplets, but then there are aerosols. Okay, and yeah. sometimes the virus can be flung up to even 10, 12 feet across. Yeah. So, and 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 I don't know what happens if somebody has gone in a lift and sneezed or coughed, and there is an aerosol hanging in that lift. Then the lift has got its fan on, and somebody then gets in after the individual has got out of the lift, and that fan is circulating the virus at high velocity and going into the individual's nose or mouth or eyes. I don't know what happens. Can that cause infection? Possible. So, what's the now? I should ask you a personal question. You are in the eye of the storm. You are there with COVID patients left, right, and center. How are you protecting yourself? I wish you all the best. First of all, I mean, you are smiling. You are there, and you've been there every single day, working fourteen, sixteen hours. It's unimaginable task wearing that bloody PPE, that being around, not being able to go to the loo, not being taking a sip of water. I understand. Tell me, how are you protecting yourself? We all wish you very good luck on this, absolutely. But I want to ask you do that. Yeah. So you can see on my nose now. I'm getting this perpetual sort of a, you know, a, a, a deep groove, you see, which is mark on your nose, is it? Yeah. So it's getting there's a groove which is getting pigmented and growing by the day. Two is that as far as possible. So maybe if say I I try to keep my hours in the hospital about eight hours, or, and on that time once I step out of my car until I step back in, I don't take my mask off. So I've I've started to develop uh, problems with my hydration because I don't drink water during those eight hours. Nor do I eat anything. Yeah, but that is the time that I I keep the mask on because I mean we understand that yes the 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 masks have their own limitations, but in the end they do reduce the amount of inoculate that goes into your system secondly when i'm dealing with patients uh, and i i of course wear a, a mask which is a, you know an n95 but i also have a face shield so that also further reduces the amount of uh, you know uh, viral uh, material blowing towards my face i avoid touching my face at all times i carry a hand sanitizer with me so you know whenever i'm touching buttons on a lift or you know a door handle or whatever i try and clean my hands you know after i've done that i try to avoid touching my phone as much as possible but if i touch my phone i try and keep my hands as clean as possible so that i don't inoculate virus onto my phone and of course whenever uh, you know in terms of the the hospital as a system when we are having our uh, in the, uh, our doctors intubating or carrying out any kind of procedures that time of course the level of the pp is taken up multifold so as to try and prevent them from getting infected but essentially the bottom line is don't take your mask off okay try and have some kind of eye protection like a shield try and keep your hands clean okay and i think that it, that helps because uh, that really reduces the amount of viral inoculum that you're exposed to thank you dr watsell for helping us with this now this is the last question with the lockdown unfold unlocking happening now with a big way and the trains going to be starting very soon people have started becoming a little careless now you know you have navratra going you have diwali coming you have christmas coming the cold winter setting in what advice would you give people in the months to come so that they do not they abstain from getting it or they get minimal possible dosage what would you tell them how to see i would it? suggest that first of all look at what's happening in europe currently okay because if you look at you know we all of relaxed many of its uh, you know curbs and there was a lot of socializing that occurred including in mm. pubs and you know in other uh, common areas and there is a big outbreak now which is occurring and mortality also is going up at this point of time we have not reached the 50 60% critical uh, immunity uh, level that is required in our population right so what is going to happen as we are going to open up more and more we're going to have waves of infection coming in 
right? Now we are talking about trains opening, and then you know we have Diwali and you know uh, other festivals that may be coming up later on. What's going to happen when schools open? Because you know that's many of our, our schools are air conditioned. Yes, yeah, so you're going to have a lot of children sitting together in a crowded area, and then you're going to have teachers coming in contact with them, etc. And the children going back to their homes, and you know possibly they may not have severe infection, but they may have an elderly grandmother at home or. a grandfather or an uncle who's ill and you know again the chances of transmitting the virus are going to go up so i would have a word of caution here that yes we are you know as a country we've done quite well as compared to others in terms of you know trying to flatten the curve but by no means is the story over okay and we are as we're going to open up more and more activities are going to open more and more we're going to have more and more people getting infected and obviously that's going to reflect in more people getting sick even if they are the 2% mortality or the 5% who go into the icus or the 15% who have severe illness and let us not forget that immunity can wane let us not forget that we are also having a situation where we are having the long covid syndromes where you can have an immune dysregulation which may not be related to severe infection to begin with in the first place but the individual down the track can develop problems because of a dysregulated immune response which is relevant to his or her own particular genetics yeah so it makes sense to at the same time maintain a positive attitude but at the same time also be prudent and maintain your social distancing as much as possible maintain your hand hygiene try and keep the mask on as much as possible it's not going to hurt yeah but that's the situation where we are going to be able to give time for our immunity to develop in our population with the least amount of collateral damage thank you thank you dr watsell for your invaluable inputs and your absolutely valuable time that you given us a lot of insights a lot of understanding on this disease itself when to go to the doctor when to get hospitalized whether the antivirals are working or not what is this hyper response that you have the immune response the il6 that we talk about the doctors talk about clotting and hemorrhages i've seen retinal hemorrhages i've seen blindness happening in the in these people so this virus is very funny i've had a stroke i've seen every possible organ up, appearing with people in this virus so it's not to be taken lightly be brave the, thank you all the panelists dr suvira anand bhai Uday Uday Parekh and Vinita, thank you for participating and making. Thank you, thank you, Aman Shah. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks, Watsal. Thank you very much. The take-home message: Don't take it lightly. Enjoy yourself. Do take your precautions. And if there is any symptom, do not waste your time. Thank you. Thank and uh, we would appreciate. We might call you back, Watsal, again as the. Sure, sure. Progress. But uh, to tell all my viewers that next week we have something interesting. The big boss lady, Shweta Tiwari. who will be joining with her daughter who is coming becoming another actor in the field to have uh, she also was a covid warrior and uh, what was her experience and what was it to win in the big boss we are going to have some interesting reflection from the glamour world also and anand bhai will have to be there to share more answers to that and uh, thank you for being with us this evening and once again watsal and the rest of the gang thanks so very much for thank you. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you everybody take care god bless